All right, now we know how to sex adults, how to introduce pairs, what pairings did you do, and the risks involved. And if you guys actually don't know what I'm talking about, it's probably because you haven't seen part one of this video, which I suggest you watching before this. Don't really have to, but I'll just leave it right there, you know, just in case. Now that we have the basics down, we're gonna get into a little bit more of the technical stuff and really what the next stages are going to look like. And that's going to be how to tell if your female is gravid, what to use for a lay box, hunting for the eggs, and then finally how to incubate them. So let's sit back, relax, and talk about breeding crested geckos part two. So starting off, it's been about a week, you've paired your crested geckos, now it's time to remove the male and, well, wait. <laughs> now it usually takes around 30 days after copulation between a male and a female for the female to be gravid and then to finally lay her eggs. The question being how to tell a female is gravid, well, I'll be honest, it's pretty obvious. You can tell by the size. During this 30 day period when your female is gravid, you will exhibit her gaining pretty heavily in the stomach. Of course, having two eggs, uh, that's really where all the weight comes from. She really blows up uh, kind of like a balloon. It's pretty much the most obvious example you can see when knowing when a female is gravid. I mean, she really will get about two to three times the size that she was pre uh, being paired with the male and, you know, it's, it, she gets big. <laughs> I've also noticed within that last week to couple of days before laying the egg, my females will usually be more towards the ground or even in the lay box trying to find a good spot where to put the eggs. Speaking of lay boxes, let's move into how to set up a proper lay box. Building a lay box is pretty easy and it's pretty cheaply done. Uh, personally for mine, I just go to any of my local grocery stores like Walmart, uh, Market Basket, things like that, and I pick up those, uh, pretty much the four packs, wherever packs they come in, of the sandwich containers. After bringing the sandwich containers home, I pretty much get my Dremel, but you can also use scissors, and then just cut a little hole. This one might be a little big, but it gets the job done up the top, so the female can then go in to lay her eggs. Now, as far as what substrate to put inside the lay box, there's pretty much a good variety. Uh, the two main ones I see are some sort of cocoa fiber that you get very moist and or sphagnum moss. Personally, as you can see here, I use sphagnum moss for mine just because I feel like it holds the humidity a lot better and doesn't dry out and get dusty like the cocoa fiber. With that said, both seem to be great choices and both do get the job done. Now the big question is, do you really need a lay box? Um, I kind of find it up to you. Uh, some of my females do use the lay box, it makes it a lot easier for me getting eggs. Some of them refuse to use the lay box and usually do it underneath the lay box or somewhere by it. I'm not sure why, I, maybe they just want to make it a little more difficult for my life. If you're using a more natural substrate like me, I use uh, topsoil mixed in with some cleanup crews with isopods and uh, springtails just to make sure that the soil stays clean and there's no you know, b bad bacteria or a lot of crusty poops, things like that. If you are using other substrates like the sterile method with paper towels, I do recommend using a lay box just because having paper towels will not allow the female to burrow so she will get a little stressed and may even become egg bound and then also if she does lay her eggs say at night and then you wait 10-12 uh, hours before you actually get back in here and check the eggs, those eggs would most likely be very dented and dried out just because of the humidity. So to wrap that up, using a lightbox, highly recommended. Sometimes they use it, sometimes they don't use it, but it does help ensure that there's a moist area for the eggs to go to. If a female's not using eggs, let's talk about hunting for eggs, because even if you use the laybox, like I've said, it is not 100% guarantee your female will utilize it. So that last week of those 30 days before the females check their eggs, I'm basically checking them out every day, seeing kind of what, where they're at generally, you know, what they like to stay around, and then if I see them in the dirt, you know, around what area that dirt is to make sure that if they do and lay those eggs in there, I know a good idea of where to check. Now, some of your geckos might be a little sneaky about it. I've had definitely a red Dalmatian give me surprise clutches where she didn't even look that gravid, and the next thing I know, there are eggs in the lay box, where other geckos like Xena there pretty much digs a burrow and stays in it for the day and then lays the eggs, making it a lot easier for me. So during those pretty much, you know, three to seven days, I'm pretty much checking around the soil every now and then, making sure that there are no surprise clutches, and really just checking all around. You know, the lay box, although it is a very good tool to utilize, and like I said, sometimes they do use it, it is not for sure. So I make sure that I give a good check around the entire bin for that week, just to make sure that I'm not losing any eggs. So when in doubt, check the entire enclosure. <laughs> Moving on to the final step, you got your gravid crested gecko, you put your lay box in there, maybe she utilized it, maybe she didn't, but without that aside, you know, you have eggs now, now how do you incubate them? So I think we do need to keep in mind that crested geckos, although only laying two eggs a clutch, do lay up to 
10 to 14 eggs, you know, throughout the year. So you're gonna need a pretty big spot to fill all those eggs, depending on, you know, how many females you have. Doing a few crusted geckos like I did last year. Um, personally, I just used a large, uh, pretty much the sandwich container like I used for the egg boxes, and I just marked them, sectioned them out on the top, and wrote the dates on each one for each. And uh, each sandwich box did have each female, so the eggs weren't being crossed. So, you know, like Xena, the Super Dal Tiger, had one sandwich box with her eggs in it, whereas my Dalmatian Tiger had another box to where the eggs go to. However, this year is a little different for me. I'm breeding four females this year, so I should get anywhere from 30 to 40 eggs somewhere um, in between there. So actually, I'm utilizing uh, those little calendar medicine distributed things, you know, to sort out your medicine for the month. <laughs> Each of these boxes have about 30 slots, I believe, give or take. I might be wrong on that. I didn't count the slots in the boxes, but pretty much that is that. I um, section them out, and then, you know, each one goes, each egg goes in, and then on top where the top cover is, I will section which female it was and the date that that was laid. Move on and just talk about, you know, what substrates you should use for when incubating eggs. Uh, there's quite a few things you can choose. Uh, in the past, I've done Perlite, I've done the Pangea Super Hatch. I do really enjoy the Super Hatch just because it shows a visual color that it's drying out. It's a little bit easier than having to go in there and, you know, test, out, test it out. But either or, it can be a little more on the pricey side. So actually this year, just because of the sheer amount of eggs that I'm getting, uh, I just decided to go with Vermiculite because it's a little more easy to find for me. And like I said, it's a little more cost efficient. Um, Vermiculite has been working great for me. I've hatched up. I think two or three clutches this way and you know so far no problem to reiterate, you know, if you are using not the super hatch, you know, you won't really get those visual clues uh, that that substrate in there, that substrate medium is drying out. So what you're going to want to do is just every little while check to make sure that it is still, you know, moist and that there is still humidity in there or else those eggs will of course dent and then unfortunately perish. For the big question, do you need an incubator or do you not need an incubator? And pretty much I've done it both ways. From my first year starting breeding to now, I've made a lot of changes and adjustments into the way I've been doing things. Uh, the first year, just because my reptile room or the room that I actually stored the eggs stayed a little bit on the cooler end, so I wanted to make sure that temperature is being regulated, so I used an actual thermostat. Uh, I can show you that it's a little DIY build. I'll put, post a link of that pretty much somewhere right here. But uh, pretty much it was a cooler with some heat tape and the VE2 thermostat with the pulsating uh, regulating, the, regulating the temperature to show me you know, what temperature the eggs would be at. With that method being done, I held the temperature steady at 74 degrees and every egg hatched out, except for that little accident that I had where I lost a few, but pretty much the eggs, nothing to do with my mistakes. Uh, I did have 100% hatch rate other than that. It was the incubator did completely fine and yeah, I had a lot of babies. However, this year is going to be a little different. I, like I said, I made some changes. I am actually converting this room to be a little more hotter and a little more humid. So right now I'm in the works of getting a humidifier, setting it to 50% so that this room stays at a constant 50% humidity for my tropical species. Also utilizing a space heater to make sure that this room stays anywhere from 74 to 76 degrees and does not drop any lower, keeping the ambient and the humidity up. With that being said, I did not feel that an incubator was really a must, it's showing that, you know, pretty much how my ambient humidity and temps are being in here, so I decided that instead to let them just incubate in the box alone, I just have it sitting on top of one of my grow tent enclosures. <laughs> The way it lets me utilize is the incubator for something else. For instance, I'm using it for the clutch and mixing black king snakes eggs I'll be having because those temps need to be a lot higher than the recommended room temperature that the crested geckos need. So do you need an incubator or do you not need an incubator? Well, it's pretty much up to you and really what your current climate is. You know, if you're the room that you're keeping your crested geckos in stays a little bit on the colder end, maybe you have temps that drop into the 65 to 68 degrees and you're just utilizing some uh, supplemental heating for those enclosures for your geckos, I would recommend an incubator because that's a little too cold for eggs. However, if you do stay in that temperature range of 72 to 75 degrees, it's really not a, you know, need. It's more of a want to kind of make sure that everything stays at this congruent uh, temperature temperature. That's pretty much it. Now you get to sit back and do the worst part of reptile breeding, which is wait for those eggs to hatch. Trust me, about two months in, you will go crazy checking those eggs every single day. And then, in the moment that you're like, you know what, I've been checking these guys every day, I need to stop, that's when they hatch. They hatch when you stop checking, and then, you know, you wait a couple days and you go, and then there's babies in there. That's literally what happens. Oh, you're expecting babies? They're not coming. Oh, oh, you're done? You know, you your expectations are lost, and now you don't want to check them? Well, guess what? They hatch now. <laughs>
Depending on the temperature range you have, crested geckos eggs will take anywhere from 90 to 110 plus days. Um, I recommend if you're a little bit new at it, keeping the temperatures a little lower on the 70 to 72, making the egg incubation longer. It does hatch out more sturdy adults and they are a little larger, a little healthier just because they've been um, metabolizing that egg for a bit longer and it really just makes an easier experience. I mean, waiting that 20 to 30 days x-ray is a huge plus for the crested geckos. Uh, I really could see the difference between when I first started, I was breeding, I was incubating at um, 70 to 72 versus going up to 74 degrees. Uh, the size of the babies when they hatched out was a significant difference and just getting them acclimated to, you know, being alive, I guess, uh, feeding, things like that. It was a lot easier with the larger babies that were incubated longer than the shorter incubation ones. And then finally, the last bit of advice I can give to you guys when breeding crested geckos is bad things will happen. Now, no matter what you do, no matter how safe you are, no matter how much you know, you will get a string of bad luck from time to time. Just the way it goes when breeding reptiles, everything isn't a 100% sure things, accidents occur, just things are out of your control occurs, and just, you know, just be prepared, you know, don't get those hopes up way up here that, you know, everything's gonna go fine your first run. So like my first run coming back into breeding crested geckos, I, my god, these birds, man. <laughs> Owning birds, people, you know, here's your, here's my advice for that. Don't do it. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, but for instance, my first year getting back into breeding crested geckos, I had one female that just, I don't know if there's some genetic issues going on to play or what's going on maybe of her past uh, life because she did come to me as a bit of a sub-adult and maybe I'm not sure what happened, but just the eggs she laid, was, it was very off. Usually when pairing crested geckos, if you have fertile eggs, they are this nice, pearly white, smooth egg. Um, this girl was not this my first year breeding her I did breed her and they came out these just odd looking shapes and odd consistency It wasn't like solid uh, a lot of people said it's not a calcium calcium deficiency I've checked her calcium sacs and they were full uh, She was getting fed a more calcium calcium supplementation making sure that the calcium was good But yeah, these eggs are just strange Even though I didn't notice that I did persevere and just kept pushing forward with the eggs I incubated their full term and they did hatch they took longer to hatch but they did hatch and they hatched some amazing geckos. These were pretty much the prettiest geckos I actually ever hatched out of all my breeders. Whatever the issue became, um, they did not last. Uh, those eggs, or the babies out of those eggs were about one to two weeks in before they kind of pretty much only lasted about two weeks and then fell one by one. Uh, it was very, very crappy. Uh, pretty much, I think I hatched out four, maybe six of those babies and none of them made it. They all got to about that two week period and then they passed. Next clutch would hatch, they would pass. I'd it was a very stressful time for me. I kept trying to figure out, because see, all of Xena's babies, my super dial tag, they were thriving, they were gaining weight, but these guys weren't. So, you know, it's not something like, oh, maybe my husbandry was off, I was trying to correct things, maybe I'm like doing something wrong, but I don't know. I think I chalked it up to being something genetically wrong with the gecko to where and there's just something going on there. So like I said uh, in previous videos, that is that girl up there. She's retired now and she's a pet only gecko. She was actually still my favorite gecko, she's most, my most handleable, but she is just not a breeder and she will never be a breeder after that. But I just wanted to give that story to you guys so you know to tell you even if you're doing everything right and you've done your proper research things out of your control will happen and it is a crappy experience I will tell you having that first year of having six babies die on me I mean it's heartbreaking you know putting your time your energy in there just to have these babies not thrive and pass I mean it's it's a sucky feeling and I feel like if you are gonna breed crested geckos you know it's not all these funny games that people make out to be hardships do happen and it is something you have to be aware of you know, have a little bit of thick skin about sad story that's gonna wrap it up so now we know how to look for a gravid gecko how to make a layer box how to search for eggs how to incubate those eggs and then just some things that may go wrong when breeding crested geckos if you guys want me to extend this series into a part three, which will be taking care of hatchlings, you know, the next step after those eggs hatch, let's get this video to 50 likes. Um, yeah, that's pretty much gonna be it. If you wanna see some more of my animals or my breeding products, you can always follow me on Facebook and Instagram at DBCB Exotics. Other than that, of course, we have the podcast, The Herp Hour. Herp Hour is a podcast that I do with myself and Professor Herp. I believe we either are just about to, depending on when this video comes out, we are just about to, or we just did a podcast with Homegrown Scales and talked a little bit about Toke Gecko and Ball Python breeding. Uh, the next one I believe is going to be Scales13, which is a YouTuber uh, actually on this platform. If you guys haven't checked out Scales13, give him a look. He's got some good content. You know, give him a subscribe. Small YouTube trying to make it. I'm still, you know, we're all small, but it's a tough thing, you know. Get that guy a subscribe <laughs> while you're at it, too. Why don't you hit that subscribe button for me, big guy? Yeah. <laughs>
And uh, that's gonna do it, guys. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. Have a great day.